Hello and welcome to this lecture on the general principles of GPIO, General Purpose Input Output. What we're going to look at in this short section is why GPIO is needed and the sort of thing it's used for. Then we'll delve into how it's working in terms of a hardware perspective when you look at how things are connected up and wired up inside a chip. And then Consider that from a software perspective, if you're a programmer, how do you access this sort of thing? And we'll intersperse this with a bit of a discussion about the merits of GPIO, and especially when we'd use it and when we wouldn't use it. So let's start by finding out you know, what we'd need GPIO for. I've got a little picture on this slide, which is a Raspberry Pi. I've um, downloaded this open source picture from the internet and it's just expanding one of the connectors on the Raspberry Pi on the right hand side and it's got a number of pins, there's 40 of them they're in, in two rows of 20 and it shows in text what those pins are connecting to internally so some of them are connecting to ground, that's the black boxes some of them power, the red boxes and then there's GPIO and there's analog input and so on that are in different colours there's a wide variety of GPIO or I.O. pins on here. And any time you need to connect your processor to the outside world, you need I.O. Why would you need to connect your processor to the outside world? Well, it's because it's useless without that. Now, a computer, a processor that's not connected to anything, is completely useless. For it to do something, it needs to interface with the outside world. And GPIO is the most general or generic way of doing this. It's, it's called general, and that's because the pins can be controlled under software programs, uh, based on your software programming. And you can use your program to make those pins toggle and change and conform to almost any pattern, to allow it to connect to almost anything that you need to connect it to in any way necessary, as long as it can be handled with digital logic. And we'll see more some of these examples later. Um, but one I've downloaded from the internet is this picture on the right hand side which is a uh, Arduino, that's a standard uh, microprocessor um, board, controlled plant watering system. It contains a lot of I.O. It's not all GPIO, some of these are different types of I.O. but there's still plenty of GPIO in there. You could take a moment um, and just identify which peripheral devices there are and which ones are likely to be inputs, which ones are likely to be outputs. That's a good start. And this is the kind of system you're going to be able to build. And when you do this, you need to look at the peripheral, the thing you're connecting to the microprocessor, and you look at the design of the peripheral and how is it supposed to connect. Uh, some peripherals, they'll have a single way of connecting. Maybe they need to connect to one pin on the processor. And some peripherals, maybe they'll use a type of serial connection or parallel connection. A typical serial connection is USB. I don't think any of these here use USB. But if they needed to use USB, you'd connect the USB pins to the peripheral. But it's always driven by the choice of peripheral. If you have a particular peripheral, you need to connect that to the processor in a way that the peripheral understands. And if that peripheral is designed in a strange way, it has a strange protocol, or strange way of being talked to, then your processor has to talk to the peripheral in that way. And if the processor doesn't already know how to do it, it's your job as a programmer to write the code to make the processor do that. So typically, most microcontrollers that you're going to use, and that would uh, mean tiniest single chip microcontrollers up to large system on chip devices with an ARM processor in such as the kind of thing that you would find powering your smartphone these contain I.O. hardware built in they have many smart controllers for different peripheral types and there's so many different peripherals that many of those have smart controllers as well now, if your peripheral uses, let's say, SPI, something we'll get to later, and your processor supports SPI, generally you would use the processor's SPI module to talk to the peripheral's SPI port. That's typical. 
But like I said, you could also use GPIO general purpose I.O. pins, such as shown, sorry, such as shown in the top right hand, um, at the right hand side here. You could use the GPIO pins on the microcontroller to talk to the SPI pins on a device. Sometimes you need particular signal voltages that require specialist I.O. Um, but sometimes you just need a, a logic signal. You know, you want an LED, it just needs to have an output which is high to turn the LED on or low to turn it off. Sometimes the other way around. Or you have a switch. You want the microprocessor to input uh, data from whether the switch is pressed or not. You just need to connect the switch to a GPIO pin and sense whether the switch is pressed, the pin is low or high and the switch is not pressed. Sometimes it's just very simple. So how does this work in hardware? Well, the first thing we need to know is that everything inside a computer, or everything inside a microprocessor or microcontroller, these are words I use interchangeably most of the time, everything can be described by three operations. Computers read in data from somewhere, it could be any module connected to a bus or any peripheral. The processor, it does something with that data. And then the processor writes that data to somewhere. Everything you see is a form of that. Everything you hear. If you listen to music, MP3 music being played back by your microprocessor, what's happening is the CPU is reading compressed MP3 format from a file it's processing it to decompress it, and then it's taking the decompressed audio stream and writing it to an audio module for it to be played back. When you play a game, some information from a file or maybe a joystick or a keyboard is going into the CPU. The CPU is doing something in response to that, and then it's writing data, which is pixels, to a graphical display card or a graphics unit which is a, a peripheral inside the CPU, talks to a display. Everything you do in a computer is reading something in, doing something to it, or writing to it. So it makes sense that being able to read something in or write something is extremely important and it needs to be extremely convenient. It also makes sense that there's many places you can read from and many places you could write to. What's happened over the years is that there's so many different modules or peripherals inside a chip and outside that the most convenient way of wiring them up is through a bus or a set of buses. And there's three main buses or three main components to what we normally call a bus, which is a data bus, an address bus, and a control bus. Taken together, we usually, def derive, uh, we usually define this as a bus. But there's a data bus part and an address bus, bus part and a control bus part. And these connect from the CPU to every other module inside a system on chip or microprocessor. The data bus is a bundle of wires. If you're talking about a 32-bit processor, then usually there'll be 32 wires. One for each bit of data that's being transferred. Sometimes you can have a data bus which is smaller. Maybe it's 8 bits. And then the 32-bit processor, the data bus needs to transfer 4 bytes every time it sends a piece of 32-bit data. The data bus is this bundle of wires and it just takes a value that somebody or something in the computer writes onto it. The address bus is the bit that indicates where this information is supposed to go to or come from. So for example, if you're writing a pixel to the screen because you're playing a game, or your, your, your program is um, playing a game with a user, then the CPU will take that pixel, put the pixel onto the data bus, and then the CPU will tell the graphics unit, hey, this pixel is for you. The graphics unit will then take the pixel and do with it whatever is necessary. The control bus is the set of signals that tells the modules what to do and when to do it. Every bus needs a controller 
and the controller is the thing that controls the control bus. Usually the CPU is the controller, but we'll see some examples later when the CPU relinquishes control for other modules to handle the bus directly. The controller uses the control bus to tell other modules, look at this data, it's for you, or give me some data, or hold off, don't do anything. That's the kind of thing that the controller does. And it's got very strict timings. When we start looking at external buses, we'll see that external devices outside a CPU sometimes have quite strict timings associated with them. So the bus controller needs to know how fast or how slow the peripheral is and how long it takes to respond to certain things. But for now, let's just talk about internal buses. And in internal buses, the timing is really about the sequence. So when the CPU wants to read something, this is what happens. The CPU is in control of everything. The CPU wants to read an item of data from a peripheral, an internal peripheral. So it, it outputs an address onto the address bus, and this address identifies which peripheral it wants to read from, and where inside the peripheral it wants to read from. Then it sets the control bus to say, hey, you peripheral, whatever peripheral this address relates to, you, I want, I want to read something from you. You need to you know, find that piece of information and, and give it to me. The peripheral that's selected, that's, that the address bus uh, refers to, wakes up and it looks internally and it finds the piece of information the CPU wants. When it's found it, it pops it onto the data bus. The CPU has been waiting meanwhile, and at the appropriate time, the CPU says, OK, let's look on the data bus. What's on the data bus? All right, that's the value I want. You can see that timing is important. Once the CPU gets the value it wants, it tells the control bus, OK, that's it, peripheral, you can stop outputting data now. If the timing's wrong, well, if the timing's wrong, lots of problems could occur. I mean, for example, the CPU could be too quick to output an address and read the data bus. It could read the data bus before the peripheral wakes up, or the peripheral could be too slow. And sometimes the peripheral could be too quick. Sometimes the CPU uh, outputs an address and the peripheral doesn't realize that the address is within its boundaries. If the thing's misconfigured, lots of things can go wrong. But when it works right, when it's all configured properly, the timing's right, then this is extremely reliable. And it's how everything inside every computer fundamentally works. Now you can read a description of all of that in one of my textbooks. It's the computer systems textbook. It's in section 6.1. It's called Interfacing Using a Bus. Uh, there's quite a lot of text there. There's quite a lot of descriptions scattered throughout the book about this. You can access the book for free uh, in the SIT library or in other libraries. Uh, it's probably in the Singapore National Library System. If you do that, uh, you'll get a good uh, broad overview of this. But I, I just would say that at the moment, skip the bit about DMA, direct memory access. We will get to that later. But for now, it would confuse things, so just skip that little bit. There's also a lot of other resources online about using a bus. If you're not sure, just, uh, just refer to those. So, we talked about this in general, but we haven't really talked about the details, and there's lots of information in the details. Let's start with addresses. So, your home address is the thing that allows SingPost to send a letter to you. Um, the letter has got your name and address on it. It identifies it goes to you in that apartment, which is on that floor, which is on that block, which is on that street, which is on that, in that district, in that particular country. 
Everything you need to know is defined in the address. And it's the same with the CPU. The address is a, a word of data. Usually it's 32 bits in a 32-bit processor. And that 32 bits of data identifies which peripheral and inside that peripheral which piece of information. If the peripheral is memory, it is an array of data. And inside that array of data, one of those items will be the one that is identified. So once the address identifies that this memory block is being accessed, then part of the address will say which item inside the memory bus. If the peripheral is something like a serial port, then the address identifies the serial port and identifies what inside the serial port. Is it port A or port B? Is it the control register? Is it the data register? So everything inside a computer is defined by addresses. When you take all of the addresses that's possible in, in something like an ARM processor or another processor, um, all the addresses that the size of address bus can possibly manage to cover, then you get something called a memory map. Now, in an ARM processor with 32 addresses, that stretches from bottom of memory, which is address 0000000000, zero, 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 eight zeros, up to the top of memory, which is F, 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 F in hexadecimal. And it's shown in the center of the screen here. Now, it doesn't mean that every part of that memory map is used. There's parts of the memory map that are dedicated to, let's say, uh, RAM, or peripherals, or internal registers. And inside there, there's lots of gaps. Only parts of it are used. Uh, and part of this is because um, the, the memory size, the, the potential memory space is so enormous with a 32-bit address bus. But also because when you buy a CPU, you buy a variant with different functionality. So, for example, an MSP432 um, can be bought with a large amount of memory or a small amount of memory, or lots of internal peripherals or fewer internal peripherals. And we see the RAM block in the center of the, the memory map here. It's a certain size. We could buy a variant of processor with a much larger RAM block or a much smaller RAM block. It doesn't really matter. But for all processors of a particular type, so for example, all MSP432s, they will have a similar looking memory map, but some blocks will be bigger in some variants than in other variants. And the memory map shows where the control and information registers for each of the peripherals is based, or each of those blocks or modules that we saw in the, the memory map connected to the buses. Uh, and this one in the center, we can see internal registers are at the bottom. When we zoomed in part of that, at the beginning of address 0000000000, zero, 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 zero. there's a reset vector. And then addresses going 48C hexadecimal, 101418C, and so on, as we go up through memory. If we wanted to access uh, a particular peripheral, then we would need to know the address in the memory map where that peripheral was, and inside or where that peripheral's control registers were located. And then there'd probably be a block of different control registers, and we'd need to identify which particular control register we wanted to talk to or access, and where it is located exactly in memory. So, Everything that a microprocessor or CPU does, remember, we said is either it's reading some data, doing something to it internally, or writing it. The memory map, the address bus, is extremely important because this is the thing that says what you're doing when you read from somewhere and what you are doing when you write to somewhere. For example, a particular region of the memory map might correspond to video memory. So when you write bytes to that part of the memory map, it's actually um, being shown as pixels on a screen. Another part of the memory map might be an audio output register. So when the CPU writes something to the audio output register, it comes out as sound in your headphones. It's very important. And remember that this is a logical artifact created by the address bus. If the address bus has got more bits, then it can 
address a bigger memory map. If the address bus in this particular processor has got fewer bits, it can address a smaller memory map. This is for a 32-bit processor, so the memory map is enormous. In an 8-bit processor, the memory map would be a lot smaller. So one of those modules inside a CPU is the I.O. module, or GPIO module. And it's responsible for general purpose input-output. And as it's shown in here, the I.O. module has got some pins that go to the outside world. And it connects those via the data bus, address bus, and control bus to the CPU and other things inside that processor. If the CPU wants to read the GPIO port to find out what's connected to it, well, it uses data bus, address bus, and control bus in the way we've seen to read from an address. And that address is the one that references the I.O. module. And inside the I.O. module, it's the one that reads the pins that connect to the I.O. module, the I.O. port. If the CPU wants to change the value on those pins, assuming they're input-output pins, then it would write to an output register, which is inside the I.O. module peripheral space in the, in the memory map. It's the converse. Now, inside that I.O. module, the GPIO direction, so general purpose input-output, the first thing we need to know is that you can't have both an input and an output simultaneously. I mean, it doesn't make sense. You can't input and output something at the same time from the same pin. It means that pins can be changed. They can have an input mode or an output mode, or in fact, a different mode, as we'll see. If the pins are defined as input pins, then there's a single bit of information per pin. If the thing that's connected to that pin has got a high voltage, high means it's like 3.3 volts or something like that, above about 1 volt, then it will be read as a 1 inside the CPU. But if that pin is connected to ground or 0 volts, then it will be read as a 0 if, you, if the CPU reads it. We don't normally have GPIO pins as individual pins. We normally have a, a bundle or a port of something like 8 pins, or 16 or 32. So here my I.O. port A has got 8 pins. It's an 8-bit port. And I can set all of the I.O. pins in port A to be inputs. And if I did, and if they were connected up like shown here, then I would get an input pattern starting from bit 7, of 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0. Now if I read that in my CPU, my CPU would read it as binary, but it would be handled generally inside a program as hexadecimal, so that's 1, 6 hexadecimal. But as humans we like decimal, so that's 22 decimal. And you need to be a little bit familiar with how you convert between binary hexadecimal and decimal. It's not difficult, but it should be, you should get to the stage where you're quite quick doing it. Okay? On the other hand, we can define that I.O. port as having output pins. They also can be done as a, as a bundle or single pins. And each, pit, each pin in that port can output a logic high or logic low. Usually that means um, 0 volts or 3.3 volts for low and high output, respectively. And if we were to connect our output pins to a suitable resistor and an LED and then down to ground, then if the, all the pins on the I.O. port A were set as active high outputs and they were set to um, output the pattern 1010 zero, 1010 zero, one, zero, one, zero. well that's actually hexadecimal aa A. then we would see the leds light up like this now on off on off on off on off that's the kind of way that we use gpio pins as inputs or as outputs There's a bit more to it. There's a bit more complexity. Um, things that make real systems slightly more efficient than this. So let's just look at that.
on, on the next couple of pages. Right, first thing to know is that usually there's uh, microcontrollers have got multiplex pins and that comes about because it's the single chip micros, they're, they're actually in tiny little packages that don't have enough pins. So there's more function inside than there are pins. And that means that you buy a CPU that's got lots of blocks internally. You don't often use all of the internal blocks. You just use some of them. And you select which blocks to use in software, and then you choose the pins. So let's say one pin, it could be a GPIO port or a serial port or an analog input port. So in software, you would configure that pin to be a GPIO port, if that's what you wanted. So we can see the, um, the diagram at the bottom of the screen on the left-hand side. We've got my I.O. port A, and I've, um, I've defined three of those pins as inputs. I've defined three of those pins as outputs. I've defined one pin as used for its alternative function. That Maybe that's a serial port or whatever. I don't know. We have to look at the data sheet. And I've disabled one pin, so it's not used at all. OK, so if I have them as input pins, another thing is I can configure them to use an internal resistor. Or I can configure them so they use an external resistor. Um, this is designed to save hardware. So if you connect up a switch to a CPU, for example, or some other peripheral, quite often you need a, a resistor uh, that connects that pin up to, to ground, or down to ground, or up to VCC, 3.3 uh, volts. So we can configure that internally. We'll see that in a minute. And output pins, they can be configured to have high or low drive strength. So that means the amount of current that they output. Obviously, a high drive strength is going to be outputting more current than a low drive strength. So it depends what you connect up to it. If you connect up a, an LED that uh, only requires a very low current to light up, then you could have a low drive strength. But if you um, connect up an LED that needs a, a lot of current, a high current in order to light up, then you'd need to configure that pin to have a high output drive strength. All these things are under software control for most GPIO ports. I say most because occasionally you get GPIO ports that are slightly different and it'll be written in the data sheet. It might say GPIO port D can only be used as an output with low drive strength. And these are limitations on the hardware. Or it might say GPIO port E has only got four pins. Again, these are limitations on the hardware and the data sheet will be very clear about these. Basically, it means you need to use the data sheet. So let's look at that. How does it work in software? And we'll do it from the perspective of imagining that we're going to connect something to a GPIO pin. We want to use that in our program. So we wire up our thing, our external thing to the GPIO pin. And we look at the data sheet to find out the register addresses. Now I happen to have a data sheet here. Um, this is the data sheet for the MSP432. It's similar to many data sheets. And I'm looking at a uh, slice of memory map here that goes from address 4000000. This is an ARM processor. Up to 5FFFFFFF. And it tells me that the region from 4000000 to 4010000 is the peripheral region. And it says here, the one megabyte region from there to there is dedicated to the system and application control peripherals of the device. On this particular variant, uh, there's 128 kilobytes of the region dedicated to peripherals, while the rest is reserved. And down here, I can see the different peripherals, the timer, EUSCI, and so on. And if I keep going down here, I can see lots and lots of different peripherals that are mentioned. There's many of them. And the peripherals have some interesting things here. Um, they have a description, port 1 input, and they've got an acronym, P1N. And the, the acronym is often what's used in a software library. So if you use a high-level language to access this, you can use the actual address or you can use the acronym. 
So if I want, let's say, port, let's say, oh, I don't know, port 2 drive strength register, I can refer to it as P2DS in a high-level language if I use the right library, the, li the right, let's say in C, the right .h header file. But in this data sheet, I know that it's got an offset 009 hex. And the, the base register is 4000 4C00. So that means if I actually want to access this port 2 drive strength register, I need to find this at address hexadecimal 4000 4C09. Okay, 4C09. That's the address that I would find it at. I'll just uh, go to the beginning of the data sheet so you can take a look at uh, what it is. It's very typical for Texas Instruments. MSP432, the variant P401R and P401M, mixed signal microcontrollers. Um, and it starts off generally with an overview of this ARM 32-bit based device and all the different things that it can do, the description and so on. And generally they will have a, a block diagram that's uh, yeah, more complicated than the one that I had a couple of pages ago in my notes. But if you were going to have a look inside it, you would see much the same thing. You would see a CPU connected to a bus. And somewhere on that bus, you would see GPIO. Here it's called IO ports. Okay. So the IO ports are connected to that bus, as is the... SRAM, ROM, and flash memory blocks, and all sorts of other bits and pieces of fun things that we're going to get to look at in the next few weeks. Let's overview this again. So I'm going to tell you how this all works in software. So we connected something to a GPIO port, a pin. We look in the data sheet to find out what is the address that controls that pin. And then we configure it in software. First of all, we set that port to use GPIO or IO instead of using the alternative use where it's a multiplex pin. It can be chosen to do different things. Then we use the port enable register to enable that pin or that port so that it can be used. And we use the direction register to set it as an output or an input. We can uh, if it's appropriate, we can set the pull-up resistor. That's if the port is an input, we set the pull-up resistor. If the port is an output, we would set the output drive strength of that port. Once that's done, the port is set up. In code, if we want to read from that port, we would then read from that port data register. If we want to write something out from that port, then we would use the CPU to write something, to um, save a byte in that address. And to read something in, we would read a byte from that address, or read a word from that address. OK. So it's actually not too difficult to use GPIO. Um, but there's times when you wouldn't want to use it. Um, I think the main time you wouldn't want to use GPIO is if you've got a strange or complicated protocol that's already um, supported inside the CPU. So if your microcontroller or CPU uh, contains a CAN bus driver and you want it to connect to CAN peripheral, you should probably use the inbuilt CAN controller because CAN is quite a complicated protocol. You could take that peripheral and just wire those pins to GPIO port and you could spend a few weeks writing some software that would control those pins according to the CAN protocol. Yeah, go ahead if you want to. But you don't need to if it's got a block built in that does that automatically. Sometimes you don't have that block built into the CPU. Let's take CAN bus as an example. You can buy microcontrollers with a CAN bus driver built in. But often, even if your CPU has got a CAN driver, you need an external buffer or device that goes between the CPU and the CAN peripheral. So you need a little chip there to do the driver. But once you've got a driver chip there, a hardware driver chip, 
Well, you could probably just buy a chip that does all the protocol as well. So one side of the chip connects to your CAN device. The other side is a bus that connects to your microcontroller. That bus connects to the data address and control buses inside your microcontroller. And once you connect that to a bus, it will appear in your microcontroller's memory map. Once it's in your memory map, you can write to it and read from it in software very easily. So we covered the general principles of GPIO. Um, there's a lot of things that we haven't really talked about. Um, I think we haven't talked about using it much in a high-level language. It's a lot easier in a high-level language, but it's necessary to know what's going on. It's necessary to know the low-level stuff as well. GPUs are always, or almost always, used for driving LEDs as indicator lights, often when you press buttons and so on. But when we talk about switches and buttons, there's two little topics here we haven't discussed. I think they're important ones um, to think about later. The first one is how to debounce inputs. And that means that when you connect a switch or a button to a CPU, when you press that button, the electrical contacts don't close instantaneously. They close slowly enough that the signal bounces as the, the, as the contacts get closer. So if your microcontroller it reads an input port that's connected to a switch, if it reads really fast and the switch is, is not pressed, it's reading 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. As somebody presses it, now imagine their finger going down in slow motion. Everything's slow motion to a CPU. You know, in the time it takes you to press your finger, it probably can read that a thousand or million times. So you press that. The CPU is reading 0, 0, 0, then it goes 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, and then eventually 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, as the button is completely pressed. So at the beginning it's all zeros, at the end it's all ones, but in between it's bouncing all over the place. So in software we, tem we need to have a way of debouncing inputs uh, because this can cause problems. The other thing is if you have lots of buttons, imagine you've got a keyboard with a 101 keys. It's very expensive to have a chip and wire each key in the keyboard to one input pin. Use 101 pins on your CPU, each to connect up one button. That's crazy. Much better to have the buttons in a matrix and you can scan those buttons. You can scan that matrix very quickly. In CPU um, code, you just very quickly scan through the buttons and you can pick up which button is pressed, if a button is pressed. And instead of using, let's say, 101 pins, you might only need 10 or 11, 12 pins. And we'll, we will see that later. And we'll see that in application terms, but also in theory. These are just things to, to be aware of at this moment. So, what we covered, we've looked at GPIO, we looked at uh, what GPIO is used for um, in general, what it can be used for, We've seen it in hardware, how the GPIO module is an internal peripheral inside the CPU, and all those peripherals are connected to the data bus and the address bus and control bus. And we've looked at the, the different control options for the GPIO pins, you know, pull up, pull down, um, active low. We haven't talked about active low, active high very much, um, something we'll see later. And we talked about the direction and drive strength and so on. And all these options are programmable in software. And to program them, you look at the data sheet and find the register that corresponds to the control of each pin, and then you write to it, or you read from it. We looked at that briefly in software, and we, we saw that everything in the memory map is readable and writable by the CPU, and that's how you control things. It's actually a lot easier to do it in code than it is to describe it. And then we just discussed a little bit about when we should use GPIO and we should not use GPIO, or when it's commonly used and when it's commonly best avoided. Um, I think almost all single chip CPUs use GPIO, it's very common and it's a really good thing to get to know. It's also extremely flexible. So I think that's it from me. Um, if you have any questions, I'm sure you can reach me and you can find out. And there's lots of information on the internet and in pretty much every one of the recommended textbooks about this. So enjoy playing with it in your chosen hardware.
and I'll catch up with you in our next discussion of CPU and microcontroller principles. Thank you.